a very warm welcome to this webinar. I think it's number 90 in our series, Europe Calling. These are the webinars to really get in touch with our citizens, our citizens um, getting in touch with uh, the people who matter in certain uh, areas. Our star guest is uh, Carol Dijburg, the Luxembourg Environment Minister, who is also negotiating the new rules for sustainable batteries in the Council of Member States. And we will also hear the head of the EU about uh, the Battery 2030 research um, project. Uh, it's Professor Edstrom from the University of Uppsala. And we are also joined by a, a member of the corporate world, Yumiko, uh, represented here by Christian Hagelücken. They are working on recycling our, of lithium ion batteries. And we will hear transport and environment and non governmental organization represented by Julia Poliskanova, Senior Director. This is a webinar that a lot of people seem to be interested in. We have more than 2,000 registrations for this seminar. I think, well, in Germany, of course, people are um, very much interested in this topic. A lot of people in Germany consider themselves either experts in football or experts in uh, combustion engines uh, or other types of engines. A lot of people are interested in alternative forms of engines or combustion engines or hydrogen engines and so on. So all this battery related uh, topic is something that um, people in Germany are very concerned with. That's also to do with the fact that there is really an opportunity um, that our cities might no longer be polluted by combustion engines and uh, to create cars that work on renewable energy is also something amazing. So in order to um, promote these uh, key technologies, we need to uh, make sure that some action is taken. However, there's still a lot of uh, dirty work going on. Um, for example, the batteries that we are using currently are often not recycled. They are not uh, sourced uh, sustainably. That is the case for cobalt, for lithium, um, all the components of the lithium ion batteries. So, of course, a lot of people ask, isn't it possible to create a circular economy here? Can we not, by that um, way, stop the environmental degradation caused by batteries? Um, there's also violation of human rights. And, uh, well, people don't talk about violations, for example, of human rights uh, when it comes to combustion engines. Copper sourcing, etc., plays a role there as well. That's kind of um, not really a big uh, topic. However, that is often brought up in connection with um, EV uh, batteries. But uh, either way, raw materials will always be a part of batteries and battery cells. And that is why I'm delighted that the Commission has uh, taken an important step. step that is to um, suggest a new a uh, piece of legislation, a new regula regulation for batteries, which means that there will be a new level of responsibility of the producers uh, of batteries. When it comes to the ecological aspects, for example, when it comes to uh, social responsibility and so on, these will be the topics uh, for today. And I'm really looking forward to our debate. I'm the shadow rapporteur for the lead committee in the European Parliament, the Envy Committee. And I will also take part in the work on this new regulation and on this new proposal. And I'm looking forward to working with Carol in that respect. Uh, just one more technical remark before we start. We will record the sem seminar. Um, so everyone who will say something will be recorded as well. I hope that's fine. However, you can also ask uh, written questions in the Q&A section down there. Please feel free to ask uh, questions there, to post them, um, to um, rank other people's um, questions, because uh, if you give them a like, um, they will move up in the ranking, and so we will hopefully be able to address the most pressing or the most popular questions. And um, 
another thing. There are lots of uh, attendees here already, but it is a very important topic. So please uh, go ahead and distribute the fact that we are having this webinar here. So post about it in social media. Use uh, my tweet that I've just um, posted on Twitter. Um, pass everything on, pass the messages on, facts that you find interesting. Um, please just feel free to use whatever you hear because I think it's just very important to spread the message. So that's it from me. And I'd like to pass the floor to Carol Dieschburg for her input on this very important debate. Carol, you have the floor. Thank you very much, dear Sven. And it's um, also a delight for me to be able to join you here this evening. Thank you so much for you. Thank you to your team for having brought us together here. Uh, it is indeed a major topic, um, fundamental really, um, because we have this proposal now, we have a debate that is going on on the future regulation. So I think uh, that it's perfect timing for this webinar to have it now. And well, now is the key word here. If we want to reach something uh, positive for our climate, if we want to fight um, global warming, then we have to really act now uh, we have to come to a technology transfer within the next 10 years, uh, especially in transport, energy, consumption, and so on. And uh, we really have to make this transition possible right now, and it has to be financed as well. And when it comes to the new regulation, I think uh, it's very important to state that this is a holistic approach. Um, of course, we have a lot of um, policy approaches in uh, terms of batteries. We have a new directive from 2006, but that has to be updated. It will become a regulation. And this regulation uh, does have a more holistic approach. They look at the raw materials, they start there, and that's something where we, that we cannot turn a blind eye to. It's maybe... Uh, or it might seem unfair that when it comes to new technologies, um, social aspects or environmental aspects are discussed to a high extent, but still that doesn't make them less important. Uh, so um, that's why this new proposal, which is looking at the entire uh, supply chains, uh, chain, such a major element because it takes environmental aspects, uh, human rights aspects, uh, social aspects, etc., into consideration. And that's really the way to go. So I think um, that's a good and positive step, this holistic approach to really design the process um, from top to bottom to consider this footprint from beginning to the end, because only then do we have a realistic view of the situation. And uh, only then will we be able to... Um, give our citizens a realistic view of the situation. We have different uh, battery types as well. And the proposal also considers these different types. So it's different. It's important to talk about all materials used in these different types. And when it comes to the circular economy, that should really be the lead uh, principle. Uh, the fact that batteries are recycled or reused to the biggest extent possible. But the uh, second life, the further use of batteries uh, should also be taken into account. Um, just as health aspects, um, aspects of hazardous substances, and so on. So this transparency, information on these um, batteries and all their aspects and elements is a major factor here. And to make Europe uh, leader here and to make Europe competitive, um, this approach plays a role as well. When I went to Finland a few years ago, we also talked about the circular economy for batteries. And at the time, it was always stated that the main barrier was uh, that Europe, well, is behind really when it comes to research and uh, demand will bat of batteries will rise. That's what uh, was said. For example, for the electronic uh, vehicles um, and their batteries. So uh, we will have to move forward here. And uh, we in Luxembourg tried to act on that. We said that we need uh, better batteries, but we also need better uh, 
infrastructure for electric vehicles, electricity infrastructure, and that has to be a green infrastructure as well. So that's what we try to achieve. And we try to include all of the stakeholders here to really move this holistic approach forward. Because we don't want to stop with the batteries. We really want to create a new system for our citizens, including this infrastructure, so that citizens can really rely on that system. And that is where the regulation comes in, which we will discuss in the following months. And I think what we have to monitor really as environmental ministers is what we have to put in there. What should be the targets um, here uh, put in the regulation in black on white? What are, um, for example, scientific um, possibilities really um, to get ahead here? So that's where we need uh, the scientists' uh, point of view. And I think that wasn't so much at the top of the agenda yet, but um, together with Austria, Luxembourg also looked at whether this should be a regulation or a directive. So far, it has been a directive, the directive from 2006, and this is a very interesting question because it has an impact on how it is implemented. But uh, what counts is that the ministers for the environment really work together and create something sound and robust, which um, creates the best possible result for our citizens and for a sustainable circular economy. The battery should be part of the new industrial strategy of the Green Deal and of the Circular Economy Action Plan. Only if we manage to achieve that, people will trust in this new technology, in this transition, um, in this green transition. And uh, it's important that we not only have the batteries and the infrastructure, um, we also have to have, uh, for example, electric vehicles in public transport. We are at the top of the range here in Luxembourg and the Netherlands have also really taken a lot of steps there. So we need uh, electric vehicles for public transport across um, the whole of Europe. We need a soft type of mobility, e-mobility, uh, which is also something that we promote in Luxembourg e-bikes, etc., is something that we are very much in favor of. So we need a combination of all these factors and of all these layers and components. And of course, we need legislation for that, uh, for transport, for batteries, for infrastructure, and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Well, if everyone in the council was this determined um, in the topics of the environment and uh, clean energies, then uh, that would be a step forward. But the next speaker is Christina Ekstrom, head of the research project Battery 2030 Plus. So um, we're eager to hear about uh, the potential of battery technology. Please, you have the floor. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure to listen to the Minister of Environment and the engagement. I really appreciate that, that. And I hope I can contribute with some kind of research perspective on that. And the only thing I reacted on was actually, I don't think research is that weak in Europe. We have lots of good scientists that can contribute. We have the chance to, to really bring and help the industry forward, I think. And um, Battery 2030 Plus was originally formed to become a flagship, but then Horizon Europe didn't want flagships. We became a large scale research initiative on future battery technologies. And I'm the director of this, and I'm a professor at Uppsala University, and I started my battery research already in the 1980s. So I've been through a lot of the journey for for the lithium ion battery, which is the one we are so much talking about for uh, the current technology and also a little bit of tomorrow's technology. So what I want to do is to walk you a little bit through what kind of chemistries we see and a little bit touch upon the same problems that we heard 
our minister to talk about. And it's really this lithium-ion battery, which has became the, uh, become the game changer. And it got the Nobel Prize 19, uh, 2019. And it was actually inventions made in Europe. You should remember this. Though these uh, Englishmen, they went to US and <laughs> made the stories there. But what's typical then for the lithium ion battery that is good for you to know is we, you, have, you can look upon it as a box that you put in an application into a car, but you can also open this box and see what do you have inside. And there you have really the interesting thing because then you realize it's not one battery, it's a family of opportunities where you can play with the positive electron, you can play with the negative electron, and you have lithium ions rocking between the negative and positive electrons going into the atomic structures. And for the positive electrons, you have today a lot of cobalt, which is one of the critical elements that we are discussing. Also from an ethical point of view, how it's, it's actually mined uh, in Congo. And why can't we just get rid of cobalt? Well, it's actually stabilizing the atomic structure. It has a function. And uh, it's also the one that brings value to, to recycling. The negative electrode today is a carbon material. And it's only about four or 5% of lithium. And you can always ask, is there enough of lithium? And I would say, yes but it's very unevenly distributed over the world. So it's a geopolitical issue rather than a, uh, maybe a content issue. And this battery has now become so powerful and so uh, low cost. The cost has dro uh, dropped dramatically, really, really dramatically during less than 10 years. And this is the reason why we can see that it suddenly becomes competitive and is projected to really move the electromobility market forward, but also coming into the large scale storage market where you, you uh, can uh, store uh, energy in, uh, for, for wind or solar uh, and help the renewable electricity production. So it's very useful. And uh, this is a, a picture from the European Commission of the expectations and wishes that 2018, we should see 4 million cars on the roads and then coming up um, with larger and larger volumes, but that it also should be so that we can create more jobs. And this is really important. And that's why we see all these incentives of building gigafactories in Europe. You can ask yourself, will these gigafactories have an impact on sustainability? And then we come into this picture which I, as a scientist, I have to relate to this, that we have to take the whole value chain or value circle that we should call it into account. Battery 2030 plus is very much on this corner here where it comes to going from battery materials to cell manufacturing, because this is the part which we will promote in, in Europe. This is the missing link where you find the Asians. And it means that we have to find uh, new materials, we have to find them uh, rapidly. We have to accelerate the way we find them. And that is the topic of, of Battery 2030 Plus. Then we also need to help the cell manufacturers because how can they make large quantities of battery cells without having hazardous waste materials who are using too much of energy or carbon dioxide emitting uh, uh, reactions, chemical reactions? It's a lot of things to do here uh, for a scientist. And you can discuss if it's fundamental and applied. And the beauty with battery research is that the applied and the fundamentals, they are so closely linked. So it's actually not really smart to talk about it. When you go from a battery material to a battery cell, you always lose a little bit of a capacity because you add what we call dead materials. You add containers, you add current collectors, you add a lot of things to, to make this to work. Can you reduce um, the amount of this? You can actually increase the energy per cell. And that is what's done now at the battery packs and systems. And suddenly we see that 
the smart engineers in the automotive industry can make the battery packs where you stack a lot of cells together in a box much smarter, which actually gives the car a better uh, driving range. That's happening now. So you can see that along all the whole of this value chain, you have the need of research and applied research. Uh, you uh, also, what the gigafactories are doing and why they are placed a lot in Scandinavia, we have Norfolk in Sweden, we have also two factories being built in Norway, is that we have uh, a hydropower. And the energy mix to make the batteries, but also the, how we, what kind of, of um, how we make the electricity for the electric vehicle plays a role for sustainability. So if we can play with all the, the whole chain and find the ways of reducing the environmental footprint from each step, we will take a big step forward. And of course, recycling, which is in the by by uh, battery directive, will be very important and the second life. And I think the idea that now the new Giga factors have that they use the recycling, uh, some of the recycling materials to try to feed it back into this loop will also uh, help with the um, with the sustainability. <clears throat> then you can uh, always ask what battery will be the battery of the future? Uh, we see that today we have uh, still a lead acid batteries, nickel and ethyl hydride. Uh, we have sodium sulfur. We have lithium batteries. But tomorrow we will actually have the next generation lithium ion batteries. We're much less competent today. We might have sodium batteries because sodium we find everywhere. We can have another kinds of batteries for large scale storage. And then we see that there are also new um, battery chemistries coming up in the horizon. Some of them are more near in time and some are longer away. And I think this landscape of batteries will be fragmented uh, with different kinds of batteries for different applications. So we should make the European batteries fit for purpose if we should really be smart. And this has to do with the raw materials. This has to do with uh, also that one kind of application needs a battery with certain properties, while another application might need a little bit different properties. Energy content and power content is not always the same. But if I should guess what will be the next one on the horizon, it will be the solid state lithium batteries. And they are having not this carbon materials, the negative electrode, but lithium. And this is a way of showing how the different chemistries relate to each other. You can see here that the lithium ion battery is about seven times stronger or lighter or have more capacity than the lead acid. And we see that there are things coming up in the future that can conquer the lithium ion. And that the sodium uh, state, solid state here with the lithium metal is even stronger. And if we want to have a line here on the development we want to have, is to have as much energy as we can per container. But you see one important thing. It's always the chemistry that decides. So going here to the solid state, yes, we will double the capacity, we can double the um, uh, driving range. And therefore it's so important when we also reduce what I call the dead materials in the battery uh, packs and in the battery cells to really allow as much of this sort of materials uh, capacity to be true as possible. This might also change the uh, figure while with some of the chemistry pushed towards higher uh, capacities because the research will find new smart ways of handling it. So what is then needed to enable breakthroughs? Well, we think that battery 2030 plus is one way of, of uh, having breakthroughs, that we really work on using the digitalization tools combined, combined with smart experiments and make a loop of this. And uh, 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 to accelerate the finding of new battery materials. We are in a hurry to catch up with the Asian uh, scientists and with the Asian companies doing battery, uh, batteries. 
And I think the new battery releg- regulation can be a support with tough requirements for recycling. I hope, though, that we don't build in so much uh, money and effort into the recycling. So if I come up with a really smart battery based on a lot of uh, renewable materials, that it will be not possible to, uh, to recycle, so that will be useful, useless to put that into the market. This this kind of, of uh, balance one have to think of when, my make, when one makes a regulation. The regulation is very positive in that sense that it allows a scientist to do what science on whatever you want. But it, it's important that you also can accept them new ideas. And I think it was touched upon already during this seminar that social, societal acceptance is very important. Many people love their combustion engine. To have the feeling of driving a Volvo, that's quite wonderful. <laughs> and it's another feeling. We also need a skilled workforce. We have to think that this transition actually means that we have to to upskill and reskill and and educate a number of people. And that would also put a lot of pressure on on the academic side at the universities, but also on other uh, players uh, uh, that can can give uh, knowledge to already uh, people already on the work market. We need a new business model to handle this. We need safety. The more of energy put into a container, the more close you come to a bomb. And we don't want a bomb in our cars. And we need to extend the life of the battery. So we really can use it for second life. So when we have used it in a car, we can put it perhaps in a power wall to to, uh, allow um, storage of solar energy. So uh, with this, I just want to say that battery 2030 plus is all over Europe. We are in 24 countries and we have 102 organizations and it's a mixture of academia, RTO and industry. And uh, we have also some of the large scale research facilities on board, which cost a lot of money for European Commission. And with this, I ask thank you. And if you want to follow us and read our roadmap, you're welcome. So thank you so much. Vielen Dank. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for this. I have thousands of questions to you, but I will not uh, uh, give in to this temptation and rather ask uh, those who are already doing it uh, in economic uh, practice. So, um, Christian Hagelücken, uh, Umnico, Umnico ist uh, schon dran. Äh, an äh, dem Recycling äh, von Lithium-Ionen-Batterien. Äh, Christian Hagelücken, äh, Humicore, has already started his first äh, pilot project and has gathered a lot of imper- äh, experience. So what's realistic and what's desirable with a view to the new rules and the new proposal by the EU? Ja, also wir sind da schon relativ weit. Well, we've come... Uh Quite far, I have to say, and um, when I come to the first part of my presentation, I will also elaborate on that. I think the most important message is that we cannot um, really use these technologies unless we collect the batteries properly. And that is our biggest problem at the moment. Um, When you look at, uh, for example, uh, materials from used cars, etc., the collection really is the key point here. We have a lot of progress when it comes to technologies and um, we are positive that we will be able to recycle or reuse cobalt, uh, cobalt, copper, lithium, etc., and that the footprint then will be improved um, and we will be less dependent on sourcing these materials because we can stock and reuse them ourselves here in Europe. But we will use, we will have to collect things properly. So, well, technology is quite complex as well. I can give you a lot of explanations on that, but maybe it's too complicated. Well, I think uh, that would be actually quite interesting, uh, quite fascinating. Uh, Let's look for some middle ground, make it, uh, just try and explain it so that we can understand it, hopefully. Well, okay, I'll try. 
first of all, you have to collect the old or the used um, battery. So we need uh, collection structures that work. And uh, important here are mainly the batteries used in, electron, in electric uh, vehicles because these are the large ones where we use a lot of materials. And then we need to, of course, dismantle the battery uh, whether we want to use them for a second life, whether we want to refurbish them, uh, use them in other applications, um, or whether we want to recycle them. In every case, we need to dismantle the casing and we need to get the actual battery out, the actual battery cell. And then we need to kind of uh, recycle these more conventional materials, aluminium or steel, etc. These can go to um, the respective uh, recycling plants, etc. Uh, these are processes that we know already. What we are focusing on now is the recycling of battery cells. And uh, the cells that are currently mainly used are um, nickel and cobalt. Um, lithium is always a part of these uh, cells and there are different approaches here. How do we reuse and recycle? First of all, a mechanical treatment, that's one option. You open the cell, you try to um, come up with uh, certain uh, concentrates um, so um, that we will then be able to use uh, chemistry to extract these um, materials, either the metals or mm, be able to extract the metal salts uh, to get them to a level where we can reuse them. And that's really the challenge when it comes to all these processes and the technologies and also when it comes to the recycling rates that uh, will be fixed uh, in the legislation. I have to make sure that the system is looked at from the beginning to the end of the process. Um, we have to make sure that it is really uh, doable and implementable. And um, by the way, feel free uh, to also use your presentation. Um, I just wanted to um, introduce you uh, properly, but I think I didn't really choose my words uh, rightly. But anyway, um, go ahead with your presentation. Yes, I shall do so. So, I hope my screen is good to see. I hope you can see my screen. I'm trying to share it. Noch nicht. Not yet, apparently. Um, you should be able to see a window, which you then need to confirm for screen sharing. Uh, it's not working, apparently. It did work before when we did a test. Uh, so this is classic, Zoom classic, not able to share my presentation, but never mind. Maybe some of Sven's team can help us out. So, in the background is working Dr. Max, who is really the magician when it comes to our webinars here. He is making anything possible. So, we can see the presentation now. Okay, thank you. So, uh, when it comes to my presentation, I'd first like to make an introduction, which mainly focuses on responsible sourcing. And as a next step, um, I'd like to take a look at a potential circular economy and also which role recycling plays in that context. So uh, next slide. Um, first of all, an introduction. Yumicore is uh, not just active and uh, a leader in recycling. Uh, we are also very active and uh, in a leading position in clean mobility. We are also a um, producer of catalysts, uh, for example, and of course, that's to do with the traditional uh, combustion engine cars, but they are also relevant for electric vehicles. Um, we also um, produce um, uh, catalysts for light duty and heavy duty vehicles, uh, for rechargeable batteries and fuel cells, and of course, we have these uh, different recycling technologies where we are also a world leader. 
And uh, this slide here shows um, really the um, life cycle of a battery. We are uh, quite active on most of the levels. We are not uh, active in the mining industry ourselves. Uh, we purchase uh, concentrates and metal concentrates and so on. Then we do the refinings ourselves. We produce the precursors. Um, we uh, produce the cathode cathodic material, which is then used in all uh, yeah, established methodologies uh, when it comes to producing uh, smartphones, uh, car batteries, and so on. And at the end, we um, do take the collected batteries back. We try and recycle them and make the material available again so that we really have the full circle within Yumiko. And um, Responsible sourcing really uh, is a key requirement here. That was also stated in the invitation to this webinar here. When it comes to cobalt, for example, we've already introduced um, procedures in 2004. We are also very active in the Global um, Battery Alliance um, of the World Economic Forum, which also focuses on responsible um, battery value chains. And um, just about a week ago, uh, we also announced, uh, together with other um, major cobalt producers, and that we will start a new pilot project. Or oh, it was already started. It's called. Uh, it's uh, meant to find a blockchain solution for end-to-end -end cobalt traceability. So to make sure that the mining is organized uh, responsibly and um, socially sustainable. Well, um, so we're looking at a pilot project here when it comes to the uh, key materials here, cobalt, uh, lithium, nickel, cup, copper, etc. Uh, that's the materials that we want to collect and reuse. And um, well, how do we reuse or recycle them? Um, what's important here is what we've heard um, already before, is the fact that um, we need to... Um, implement recycling a quota that are actually uh, yeah, doable, that are achievable. And for that, we need the right procedure and we need an optimized pr procedure, which is not just the case for battery cells, but also for used cars, etc. So recycling is not just one process, it's a chain of processes. Um, so you collect um, the batteries, uh, you pre-process them, you um, do end processing and so on. But that uh, will not work without any losses. Um, so scientific laws apply. There was also there will always be a certain amount of loss. So our goal can only be to have uh, optimized processes um, to minimize these losses. This calculation here is an example to illustrate that um, and how um, losses can be multiplied. Um, these are quite optimistic numbers, uh, by the way. If we assume that we have a collection rate of 70% uh, when it comes to cobalt here, uh, then um, we assume that we have a recycling rate of uh, 90 or 95% uh, respectively, then at the end we will only have a physical circularity rate of 60%, even with these optimistic figures. And that's uh, based on the quality of cobalt, which can actually be reused in new products. So that shows us that it's not just the um, individual steps of the recycling process that have to be optimized, but that also the collection is a key element here. And the regulation um, contains a no loss policy. That's also important. But that kind of policy has to be achievable. How do I make sure that there are no losses? And here, like I said, collection is a major factor. And that brings us uh, to the next uh, slide, because um, this kind of approach, uh, circularity of batteries, uh, is also something that is uh, very intensely debated within the Circular Economy Initiative for Germany, CEID. It's a project which was um, supported of the Federal Ministry for the Environment, for um, Federal Ministry for the Economy and for Research. So um, various representatives from research, from um, the corporate world and so on, NGOs, uh, 
um, participated in that and looked at the entire life cycle of attraction batteries. And the results of that working group um, can be uh, can be consulted in a report. Uh, you can find the link down here. I'm not going to go into the detail because I don't have the time, but it's really a very interesting uh, report. I suggest you have a look at it. Um, one central aspect or one central recommendation that I would like to mention, though, is um, the fact that the um, battery regulation really has to um, follow a systemic, a holistic approach, like it was uh, said. We really need to look at the entire process, the entire system, because there is a, a lot of um, inter acting between the various components. If I make changes in one area or one step of the process, and there will be changes in another step. So all of that needs to be looked at. And that means all actors, all stakeholders along the supply chain and uh, along the life cycle will have to be included. So um, the um, battery regulation in that sense is really revolutionary because at, uh, it's, the, it's really a first in that it looks at the entire system and it doesn't just look at the waste and the waste processing and recycling, but it looks at the whole process from the beginning, from sourcing and production and so on. There are also targets in the regulation. However, the uh, missing part here is how we calculate these targets. And that's a problem because then I can just calculate things the way I want just to get to that target. So we need to have very clear um, definitions very clear delineations and very clear rules for calculations. And of course, we need to have um, achievable targets, uh, realistic targets. Uh, the design of batteries, um, for example, plays a role here. It might sound very simple, but how do I open a battery cell? That's a question that plays a role here. Is it easy to open or not, etc.? Is it easy to dismantle? Uh, because then it will be easier to recycle it. There's also a battery a passport which is being planned. That is something that we consider to be very important, but also very ambitious. Let's see. Um, another point uh, which was discussed in the CID was that we need economic incentives. Otherwise, these uh, things will not happen. And um, economic incentives also means business models. They will really be decisive when it comes to B2B, but also B2C. With business as usual, if uh, we want to move ahead, uh, business as usual will not help us. We really need to look at all the actors in the business world, in the supply chain and so on. Um, we need a better collaboration, like I stated here, along the entire value chain or value chains uh, in order to create synergies. Um, hopefully that will... Uh, awaken your curiosity uh, when it comes to this report, uh, you have to just click on that one link that I gave you, you will get to the report and it's really a very interesting read, highly recommended. And now this is my last slide, just um, to show again that uh, circular economy uh, considers all aspects and I think it's a closed loop which is possible here and uh, well, that's uh, the end of my presentation as well. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. This was um, very interesting. Of course, I will have a thousand questions to you as well, but I'd like to first uh, pass the floor to Julia Poliskanova. Um, hopefully, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, maybe you can tell us uh, how to pronounce it uh, properly. But either way, you are Senior Director for Transport and Environment in Brussels. And obviously, you're not called cars and environment, you're called transport and environment. And uh, that's why I'm so uh, interested in what you have to say on the discussion on e-mobility and electric cars and electric public transport. There you go, you have the floor. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having t &E at this event and giving us an opportunity to present some of our analysis. Um, and, and Mr. Giggled, your pronunciation was absolutely excellent. So you can, uh, you can call me exactly li like that. So thanks. I will start by sharing slides and I hope that works. Um, you should be seeing my, my slides now. So maybe just to, to start with by saying that it's clear 
that today uh, batteries, sustainable batteries, are at the heart of our transport and energy systems uh, getting to the climate targets that we have set. So in the case of transport, indeed, not just cars, but batteries are at the root of making our trucks, buses, vans, as well as shared electric cars. We want to have less cars, but those that will be there in cities must be zero emission. And that can only be achieved today via batteries. Similarly, from the energy system, they're the best way to make sure that we have 100% renewable system by helping our grids cope with variable sources. And that's why so many countries now consider batteries to be the new gold. And the battle for who will really win uh, and capture the future sustainable battery value chain is on. And Europe is really well placed to be one of the leaders. But today we're focusing on um, sustainability and that's what also will, I will also do, uh, but I will also just towards the end highlight more of an industrial potential there as well. Um, I've divided my presentation into five quick areas to go through the usual questions people have about batteries. First of all, batteries versus oil. Let's all take a step back before we dive into what we can do better about batteries and just remind ourselves why we need them and what batteries are replacing, which is the main problem, the fossil fuel, the oil that we burn. In our, this is an example of a car, in our cars, trucks, buses, we burn thousands of liters of oil when we drive and it's burned, it pollutes our atmosphere and there's nothing we can do about it. When we compare this to the lithium-ion battery, at its core, it's already a circular system. You can use, and here you see, use about 160 kilograms of cell materials. The cube is very small compared to amount of oil. And if we recycle and we can reuse and recycle and recover continuously, only 30 kilograms of material is left. So you cannot compare today's system with a future battery one that will be better. Now, another big question that is often asked, well, are electric cars anyway even, even better than petrol cars, that, meaning that let's look at their life cycle emissions. And again, uh, we have uh, done uh, this type of analysis already last year in 2020, where we've compared the average life cycle emissions from an average diesel, petrol and electric cars across Europe in some key countries you can see here. On average in 2020, electric vehicle was already three times better than a petrol or a diesel car. That includes battery emissions, so emissions from battery production. That includes uh, what power system or what grids you use to charge them and so forth. Of course, you can see here huge differences. In a country with low carbon or zero carbon electricity, the difference is huge. Take Sweden, for example, in this example. Uh, and if we look at countries which have more coal on their grids, that benefit is less. It's still there, but it's not as well as on average. So we need to, absolutely need to drive to system to renewables. But if you're wondering whether or not you should wait until you're buying or switching your old car to, to a cleaner one, the answer is no, you absolutely shouldn't. If you really have a need a car, buy electric. Now it's already better. Uh, so does it mean that everything is solved? Well, absolutely not. And many speakers, of course, have already mentioned today and from our side, the new battery law, the sustainable battery regulation that the European Commission proposed last year is a key piece in the puzzle to make batteries sustainable. I would actually go as far as saying that this is the first law of its kind globally. It's the first time we're covering the entire value chain of battery from mining to making batteries themselves to recycling. And if we succeed in Europe to put it in place this strong regulation, many in the world will follow. So we actually have a lot on our shoulders to show the example and lead the world to show that we can have green batteries. So the next question, of course, and that's what this battery regulation, one of the things can help us solve is what about metals and mining? We are asked about it all the time and people rightly are concerned about where the materials are uh, coming from, how they were produced, was it really sustainable and ethical, and, and they all absolutely key, key questions. Um, look, the honest answer is that today, whether it's your phone, your computer, or your car, that cobalt probably is, if 
it has problems, it has it in all of them. So we need to make sure that it's mining across the board that we are improving, not just making good mining for batteries. But nonetheless, there's a real opportunity here to improve how we procure materials for electric cars. Here, I just would like to show you one example. Uh, this is a sample route of Renault's cobalt supply chain. So, and that's actually is quite similar to what other car makers are doing today, and we've looked into all of them. So where cobalt today is mostly mined is in Congo. Then you transport it to China, where most of it is refined. It's not just cobalt. A lot of materials today are refined in China, lithium, for example, as well. Then in the case of, of, of Renault, the batteries themselves and the, and the key materials, so the key components for batteries, such as cathodes, are made in Japan and South Korea. And then the final product, as well as the car, is then delivered in Europe. What does this show us? I would say that it shows us at least two things, both relevant for the European sustainable battery debate. First of all, what we absolutely must do uh, in a short term time frame as a, as a priority is to in make sure that all of this supply chain, all of these routes are traced and they are transparent. We must require a company like Renault to actually trace how at every step of this way things are done and whether or not every company in their supply chain is compliant with uh, global um, safety, health, human rights, social and other regulations. And this is exactly what the European Commission has proposed. And we hope that's what both the governments and the European Parliament will support to have binding due diligence requirements, because this will enable us not only to clean up what we do in Europe, but it will enable us to have an impact on what happens in other countries, because big companies can ask questions and they have power to change their supply chains. The second thing this is telling us is that, and that will take a bit more time, but ultimately, why are we sending all of this to Asia? Why are we refining this in China? And that's more of an industrial policy momentum that, and as well as environmental policy, that by moving parts of this supply chain into Europe, we can, first of all, already do them better because environmental and social standards are in the DNA of European companies. Or if we consider that it's not done better, we can simply place regulations on them to do it better because it's in Europe and we have power to do things in Europe. And there's been a lot of actually developments in Europe to produce clean and sustainable materials. There's stuff happening, for example, on the lithium side. We now can, in the future, produce lithium a uh, similar way as today we produce geothermal renewables, for example. So there are different ways and European companies are investing and we need to support them to do it in, in the right way. Uh, so what can Europe do? A lot that I've already uh, said. So I'll show to you what for us are the three priorities for the upcoming battery regulation. So responsible sourcing of materials, I've already covered. Uh, the next second one in the middle, really important, is to make sure that we manufacture batteries themselves in a sustainable way. And what we're talking here primarily is the fact that when you make a battery, you need a hell load of energy to do that. 75% of all energy that you need for a battery comes from the cell making. So all of these materials and the actual cell that, that you're producing. So what matters is location and power source. If we enable via regulation to make sure that future battery factories are sited next to abundant resources of renewable energy, the footprint of those batteries will be very low. And that's exactly what companies like Northvolt in Sweden are showing us that by producing them with, with renewables, they, they can be cleaned. And the last really important piece of the puzzle is, of course, recycling. So repair, reuse, and recycling. At the moment, in Europe, we don't recycle many lithium-ion batteries. I would say probably Yumiko is, is one of the leaders, but there not much of it is happening. A lot of them are recycled in, in China and other places. We need to bring that industry to Europe. The targets that we currently see in the battery proposals are not fit for purpose. And I specifically talk about lithium. Lithium targets today, what proposed are just so low that companies today in uh, Canada, in the US, they can meet much higher targets, at least 90%. Europe asks to do lower targets by 2030. This will not give us the advantage that we need. We don't have lithium today actually produced in Europe. So if we also don't recycle it, 
we miss a huge opportunity for a key material. And that's really important to stress. Please don't be shy on lithium targets. We can do better. So just to finish on a positive industrial story, won't batteries come from China anyway? Well, actually, no. What we are seeing now is that Europe is becoming one of the key global clusters in battery manufacturing globally. Every week I read the news and there's a new battery investment. We as t &E cannot um, actually update this visual fast enough because things are constantly changing. But as of to date, there's at least dozens and dozens. Last time we counted, there were almost uh, 40 projects announced across Europe, across all countries, East and West. So it's a real European success story. Uh, there's now new projects in Spain, for example, you see on this graph that they're not, not yet included. So this is now becoming a success story. Investments, future jobs are coming to Europe. So they, So in fact, if we put the right battery regulation in place, Europe can really be a leader in sustainable battery production globally. Thank you, look forward to the questions. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, this was really excellent. Altogether, it was a brilliant picture. But perhaps uh, also uh, for courtesy reasons, first, uh, back to the minister. Uh, do you want to come in? Uh, do you want to ask any questions, uh, please? Carol. So I, I think I would like uh, to let the floor to all those who are listening. But uh, I think uh, when I see all three interventions, I think the aim would be to really place Europe at the center of the innovation in the battery sector. And this will only be good, the, um, be done if we really have the right regulation before us. That's, that's why we are fighting. And uh, a second, so I didn't want to say we haven't a lot of research. But what I did say in, in my introduction is, um, Europe has been lacking a bit behind if it comes to the battery industry or car industry, uh, because we haven't been innovative. And for a long time, we had a lot of discuss discussions. I followed them since 2013 about car sector. And I think the most important is really to say innovation brings new jobs. And here we have a very good piece of regulation where we have to see the details. It, that's clear. That's the job for the next month. Uh, and then we can really be uh, front running and that's the most important also also to those people who are not in these negotiations who are not in research and not in the sector good ich werde dann tun was carol gesagt okay um so i will do what uh, carol uh, told me to do um and would like to ask uh, the questions of those uh, who were listening uh julia has um, touched upon some of them. I think uh, you are also very familiar with uh, the topic and the debates um, that usually happen. Um, but let's look at the questions. Uh, Frank Loeb is asking, um, what is your take on the following demands? Uh, first of all, each uh, manufacturer, um, battery manufacturer has to make sure um, or has to su subscribe to an end-to-end -end responsibility for battery products. And that means battery concepts and design must include a first life concept as well as a second life concept. And a third demand battery manufacturers has to have to um, prove that they recycle um, batteries and have to set up their own recycling um, facilities. And this uh, needs to be supervised in the EU. So what do you think about uh, these demands? Um, that's what uh, Mr. Locke uh, would like to say. And there's a second question by Helmut Horn, um, which was also asked in uh, other various uh, forms. It regards the lithium need. Even if we manage 100% recycling, the demand in lithium will massively increase due to e-mobility and that will endanger especially the uh, salt uh, lakes in Southern America. So um, can e-mobility even be ecolo ecologically or environmentally friendly and sustainable when uh, these lakes are threatened. So who is brave enough to take on these questions? Herr Hagelücken. Well, yes, I can start. I would first like um, to address the question of Mr. Lok. So end-to-end um, -end responsibility of manufacturers was mentioned here. I think indirectly we already have this. We have uh, producer responsibility. 
Mm, the extended responsibility and in the battery regulation uh, we have a similar approach so i think um, it's a good approach and it is uh, implementable when it comes to e the second life concepts i think it gets a bit more complicated because the longer i'm going to use a product uh, the better um, I will kind of distribute the CO2 footprint um, across a life cycle. So, of course, um, the first goal should be longer usability of products. But um, second life uh, will then uh, mostly not be uh, used in a el electric vehicle battery, um, but rather as a use in stationary batteries. So the use there is quite different uh, from the use in cars. Um, I could also use lithium uh, iron um, phosphate batteries here. So does it really make sense to use uh, high cobalt batteries um, from the first generation and use them for um, many years in a second life? Or wouldn't it make more sense to make sure that they are used for as long as possible and then to recycle them and then use them in uh, stationary applications? And Re or, uh, manufacture new batteries of a, a new generation. Mm. We also need uh, infrastructures uh, for second life. We need to make sure that we collect these batteries um, properly and um, that they are reused uh, properly as well in a way that makes sense. So that's a difficult question. Um, it was also stated that um, manufacturers should be able to prove that they recycle and that they should set up their own recycling facilities. I'm not sure that has to be the case because it's not the key competence of, let's say, a car manufacturer to recycle batteries. Um, I think it's important that we have a good infrastructure, an overall infrastructure for recycling, which, for example, a car a producer could use. Um, and that's why I think this um, battery passport, which is um, being discussed here um, and which was also suggested in uh, the Circular Economy Initiative in Germany, is a very good approach. And um, then Mr. Horn asked for the um, or about the lithium demand, uh, Julia. Poliskanova already discussed that. There are various sources for lithium. Of course, um, we had these issues uh, with uh, the lakes in uh, South America, Chile, and so on. Now, unfortunately, the sound has been cut, so we cannot be, uh, we cannot continue interpreting. The speaker can't be heard. Well, says Sven Giegold. Unfortunately, Christian Hagelüken has become a victim of the German infrastructure or the lack of infrastructure. Mr. Hagelücken, are you in Germany? Yes. Well, you see, that's the problem because in Germany we are suffering from our Minister Scheuer and very bad digital infrastructure. Hopefully we will be able to overcome that problem soon. So unfortunately we weren't able to hear you for a little while. Uh, last point on lithium. Yes, exactly. Well, um, the last point that you made connected to lithium. Where I was unfortunately kicked out of the entire system before as well and had to log on um, again. But I was able to join you before I had to speak myself. So that was uh, lucky at least. So, yeah, uh, like I said, when it comes to lithium, there are very interesting approaches. Um, when it comes to sourcing lithium, for example, to produce a lithium from a geothermal energy, which would then bring us to a win-win situation. I could use the energy of uh, the uh, earth uh, to produce lithium and um, to uh, produce energy. So I would have both. Of course, it is true that we will have an, a, an extreme uh, increase in demand uh, when it comes to lithium, but I think it is possible to source or produce that lithium without environmental degradation. Um, yes, thank you. Christina. I ask you perhaps to show again one slide about the different battery technologies, uh, because uh, it would be worthwhile to spend a bit more time on which metals these different technologies uh, ba are based uh, and, uh, and which of those technologies uh, are actually potentially know the other one, which showed also their 
capacity in terms of volume and weight. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Yes, uh, that's exactly uh, why I wave my uh, yes. hand. Because I give you the floor in a second. I only wanted to say in the name of many who ask questions in this direction, uh, how long do you think will these technologies take uh, to be ready uh, for a broader usage and there um, of course always discussing on what are they based which of these technologies might be coming with a smaller environmental backpack and which of those technologies could also be made uh, for uh, for cars and which of the technologies are not useful for cars so this uh, i think interests a lot of people please Yes, I'm happy to talk about that. I think, yeah, what, what's next in the horizon are the sodium ion batteries. You see here that they have slightly less capacity, so they may not be the ones that you put in a car, but you could put them in large-scale storage and then save the lithium batteries for the cars. And this is something the scientists have looked at for a long time. So the issue about the the uh, lithium lakes in Bolivia and, and Chile and Argentina has been a real issue for, for, for the scientists. And therefore, there has been this um, attention to the sodium ion. It was even difficult at the beginning to have the acceptance from the funding agencies to look at sodium. But now we see the companies are coming. They're coming, the smaller companies that are there. And, you know, for having containers of batteries for large scale storage, it doesn't really matter so much if it's a little bit uh, larger size than you would have for lithium. When it comes to the ones that you have here, magnesium, zinc, calcium, I think zinc is the nearest in time. Magnesium and calcium will take a lot of, of time before we see them. We need a lot more research. We need find new uh, components for the batteries to make it stable, and, and functional and, and you can uh, compare and compete with the lithium ions when it comes to uh, charge and discharge for many thousand cycles. The one that we do think will come faster for cars than you, uh, than we actually, is the, the solid state, but it also has lithium. It has even more lithium than the lithium ion because it's based on the lithium metal as a negative electrode. And, but here, because you, you double the content of energy in it, and you try to use what you have learned from the lithium ion to, to really make it really in a sustainable way, I mean, the production of it, it might be actually so that this can be really competitive not only in times of capacity and a range for a car, but also when it comes to sustainability. But it all, it all had to, to compare with the price, the safety of lithium ion, and also with the, how long you can use it. You talk about batteries if, like they were human beings. You talk about aging mechanisms, you talk about lifetime. And the way you handle your car influences the lifetime of a battery. There is a path dependence, how you drive. Uh, yes, like you treat your own body when you're a human being, it, it influences your, your uh, de death. <laughs> and that is what. Then we have other kinds of organic batteries and, and so on that uh, can be for other kinds of applications. And I think we see now that you might need some kind of batteries for the robotics coming, you need to downscale batteries for the medical implants, etc. So therefore, I think the, the almost the whole sort of um, picture here will be used for the batteries of the future, except nickel, cadmium, lead acid, and, and uh, but there, the other ones you will find because mm -hmm. of the uh, raw material issue. I find it also interesting that we now suddenly start to find more lithium in Europe. You find it in Portugal, you find it in Finland and Sweden, etc. So it's it's something we have started to look at or our own resources in a new in a new way. And then there comes the other question: 
can we start mining in, in Europe or is that just too dirty for us to, to accept? That's an ethical question, actually, <laughs> as well as a sustainable. <laughs> so, so I would say uh, to the question on, on the lithium uh, uh, lakes in Bolivia, there are things coming up, but it will take time. And this picture was a way of showing that some of these calcium magnesiums take longer time while the zinc, the sodium, the solid state are, are closer in time. And some of the new EU projects coming up in the battery partnership uh, are in this region, new generation lithium and solid state, and uh, also some of the uh, non-lithium systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, Julia, do you want to come in? Yes, I wanted to maybe raise indeed this question that often comes up on recycling versus mining. I think everyone is absolutely correct to say that in the in the short term, we will not just have lots of recycled material or enough to replace all the mining. But what we see in our studies, there's a huge difference between the demand for mining going like this globally and just, you know, <laughs> flattening the curve, not for the, for the sake of, of a better word, and instead the curve going like this, a big, big difference in terms of impact it has environmentally. And longer term, the objective should be that the primarily the focus is on using recycled secondary material. But as we get there, and it will take some time, and we will always need primary materials, they just need to be sustainably produced and ethically sourced. And that is the combination of both that we will realistically need going forward. Yes, I uh, will read a few additional uh, questions which have been asked. And, um, and that is, uh, first, um, uh, Martin, uh, wer immer das ist, fragt für stationäre Batterien. At first, uh, Martin, uh, for stationary batteries, salt water um, batteries will be perfect because they don't contain rare resources and um, they should be recyclable. And Wolfgang Lohbeck, as we uh, know him uh, from Greenpeace, I think he used to be with Greenpeace, at least I don't know if it's still the case, also asked, why don't we also demand and talk about the fact that we would need fewer batteries, not just better batteries. So a weight limit for um, cars, uh, no more SUVs, a ban on SUVs, because clean uh, batteries do not lower the electricity uh, consumption and its effects. Um, for instance, in uh, slowing down uh, the coal uh, phase out. And Friedhelm uh, Hansen uh, is pointing out Jena uh, Batteries. It's a company. Um, working uh, in uh, stationary batteries, um, fixed batteries, and uh, working on metal-free batteries. So that's another question to uh, Christina. Um, batteries which are stationary, fixed, and metal-free, isn't that, wouldn't that be a good idea? And the other uh, question with the salt water batteries uh, is a similar uh, direction. And there are many uh, more such questions as Wolfgang Lubeck just um, they're not phrased as nicely, so I'm not going to repeat them all, but it's really about the same question at the heart of it. If we're not, uh, sh shouldn't we also try to limit our uh, consumption of batteries? And then I have a question to Christina, uh, to uh, Mr. Hagelücken, and to Julia Pulnoskavia. Mr. Hagelücken, you had a really nice slide with your assumptions theoretical assumption about uh, lithium recycling. And I thought that indirectly you were saying that uh, Julia uh, was right. I'm just going to uh, call her by her first name now. The second name is too difficult, Mr. Giltis. So if you're saying the recycling efficiency for lithium is uh, should be at more than 90 percent but for car batteries we are going to work towards uh, collecting 100 percent of the batteries then why can't you just say come out and say uh, tne are correct 
the targets in the battery regulation proposal are way too low. I think you have just found a beautiful partnership with T&E by showing us this slide. Um, this uh, question, which is the most uh, asked question in our chat, maybe we could see that slide again, because uh, it really caught my eye, obviously, and I would be very happy if you could just say, you, Julia is right, we do need higher um, recycling targets for lithium. Well, while we're looking for the slide, here it is. I can say the following. Of course, she's uh, right. And we have had a very positive exchange in many areas. But if you look at the slide in a little more detail, this is not about lithium, but cobalt, the cobalt yield, it says. And that is not really exchangeable because uh, it's a completely different way in the recycling chain. So cobalt, uh, copper, nickel is a metallic phase that can uh, be concentrated by the recycling process, but whereas lithium is um, not as noble, so it's much uh, more difficult to recover. You have to have different procedures, maybe with the slag phase or something else. So such high lithium yields, 90% uh, in the medium uh, short term future, I don't think that's realistic, but I do um, agree that the 35% that we have in the draft battery regulation at the moment for 2025 are rather um, unambitious. And uh, we also talked about it in the Circular Economy Initiative. We had a suggested 50% by 2025 uh, and then 70% by 2030. I don't know if we could get further than 70 percent. Um, sorry, 85 percent is what we proposed. 85 percent by 2030. I'm not sure whether it's possible to get more than that, simply because of the thermodynamic processes that are involved um, when recovering lithium. And you have to um, look at the entire process chain. It's not enough to just look at the uh, chemical uh, lithium uh, process, but also if you have a shreddering process before that, so how, what percentage of the black mass will um, be lost? And then you'll also lose some, uh, lose some lithium and cobalt. And that uh, step, well, okay, so I didn't see that correctly, but even with cobalt, that would lead uh, to much higher targets for the regulation. No, Mr. Hagelukin says no, because the regulation, draft regulation for cobalt has the following targets. Let me see, 90%. So if you multiply it, the recycling rate is the product uh, of the 90 and the 95%, and that's uh, 85%. Yes, but you have been uh, quite conservative or pessimistic about the collection rate. Uh, I mean, uh, I hope that uh, apart from the few cars which uh, are burnt, you can collect them because it's very different from uh, your everyday batteries. You can't just throw them in the bin. Uh, unfortunately, many people just, uh, just still throw away their normal batteries. Julia, what do you think about this uh, discussion? What's your opinion on this? Well, first of all, can I just say it's really great to hear from Yumiko that they can go to 85% recovery target for lithium. Um, I hope that everyone here can note because the current proposals of the commission are only 70%. And maybe just to add that uh, it is absolutely true and it's supported by research and pilots that we can go above that. But if in 2021, uh, we hear a leading company saying that they can do up to 85%, I really believe that by 2030, we will be going a lot more because innovation is there and we have excellent, excellent companies in, in Europe. Um, maybe, Mr. Giggled, if you allow me, I can just add a quick uh, point also on, a, on the issue around less cars, no cars and using uh, less, less batteries. We don't focus on that because we kind of jump in into the battery regulation and what we can do better. But of course, there's a bigger picture out there. And we at t &E certainly believe that, especially when it comes to our cities, we shouldn't really be having anywhere near the amount of cars or vans we have at the moment, for sure. We can imagine car-free cities where people share, where people use public transport. Transport. 
But I would add, however, that we should look beyond cities. And if I live in a, in a very rural area for me today, for example, actually having an electric car is the best, potentially the best solution. Uh, and it's, it's still small, right? You have to, of course, make sure you, you share, you use it for the whole family, not just drive alone all the time. But for some use cases, cars will continue, shared cars, fleets, business cases, even electric bus needs a battery. So going for electric uh, electric technology, going for batteries and the whole value chain in, in Europe is no regrets, even if we have less resources. Less and sustainable, is, it, it needs to come together. Uh, sorry, just one, 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 one quick remark to, to avoid that tomorrow in the press, we can read Yumiko <laughs> recovers 85% this year. Uh, and, We are not there at the moment. We are confident that until 2030, in the magnitude of up to 30, 85% lithium can be recovered uh, in a state-of-the-art uh, process as we are developing. But please, we, we are not there at, 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 at the moment. And to the other question, of course, and this is a whole discussion about electromobility. If you, if you replace every combustion engine car one-to-one -one by an electric car, Uh, you have not saved the world. You, you still have congestions, you have a, a lot of uh, room which is covered, you have a lot of, of unproductive resources and so on. So, of course, it's also about systemic um, 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 uh, improvements uh, and, and, and optimization and, and having a yeah, better utilization of, of private cars, having more shared vehicles and so on. And by the way, this also would facilitate to close the loop at the Um, at, at the end of life. Um, may I also comment? Yes, I think uh, now it's by having turn. more powerful batteries, you can actually also, if you, if you have the social acceptance that you have a car with a certain driving um, range, you could accept to keep that driving range, but with a smaller, more powerful battery, then you can reduce the amount of, of material. But that is not often the case. People want so much. As we say in Sweden, we drive about five kilometers per day per person. But uh, when you want to go up to the mountains for skiing, you need your big car. And that's once per year. So <laughs> you have to actually uh, change your attitude. Christina, there was another question for you uh, before, which I re uh, read in the beginning. And that was about uh, the solid, uh, just a moment, uh, the, not to forget it, exactly. So what uh, was called here Salzwasser uh, Akkus, so this is sodium. Uh, and, uh, and, and the questioner says it doesn't contain any rare earth and uh, should be uh, easy to recycle. So. Uh, and I would also be interested in your view as a scientist on this debate on the recycling targets. So what do you regard as doable uh, and uh, uh, where should we head for in order to give innovation a boost, which is, of course, what we want as Greens, but we also don't want to put loony targets into a, a regulation. It has to be doable but ambitious. This is what we want. Uh, so what do you, what is your take on this debate? I, I think it's interesting because, uh, of course, as a scientist, you try then to make the non-cobalt materials uh, um, sort of possible for batteries. And some of them are even giving you even more powerful batteries. Uh, but that is maybe not what Yumikor wants because you know you need to have a re return on investment on the recycling. I, I don't know if Mr. Hagelukin would like to comment upon that. Uh, when it comes to, to uh, what I think is a challenge, I think lithium, to recycle lithium is a challenge because this little small atom can stick everywhere in your uh, materials and you want it often in a form that you can use it as a, a raw material for your synthesis of your new materials. And I have done some of that science myself, so I know how clean it must be to really be useful. So I, I believe uh, Mr. Hagelukin when he says that that takes 30 years, uh, until 2030 to reach uh, 85%. I think that's important for research. 
to really support that development. Um, yeah, there's so much to say about different concepts. You had also the concepts of, of, of metal-less batteries, of course, uh, but they have often not the capacity per volume you need for a transport sector, for instance. But you can use them for other applications. That also might be important. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, to, to Julia, there was still the open question uh, by Wolfgang Lobeck whether we need more stringent rules on limiting the energy consumption. So if we would have size limits for cars, of course, batteries could be smaller or could be uh, having a longer range. So uh, is transport and environment pushing uh, for restrictions in this regard? Thanks for this question. One of the things that we can do when we look at future electric vehicles that are coming to the market, in fact, we can set energy efficiency requirements for them. And this is something that uh, some in the European Commission started thinking about. We need a bit more time because at the moment, no one has an idea as to how implement it into the law. But this is the future indeed, because I, I would agree that at the moment, uh, cars like Jaguar I-Pace or you know, the, the electric hammer is probably not what we need in European cities. It needs to be more efficient. It, size is not always the same. It's really just about, and I think that's also what we heard from the Batteries 2030 project, it's about how much power and energy you provide to your vehicle for a certain amount of materials. So it's about resource efficiency, efficiency of cars, and you can have a very small car and it's still very inefficient. So it's, it's, it's more than that, but it's part of that. Carol, mm how -hmm. um, that for you? Also, um and Carol, what would it be like for you? No more SUVs in Luxembourg. So all your bankers and finance people would not be able to show off their big cars. Would that be even doable for you? Well, <laughs> I think uh, Mr. Lobeck did uh, hit a point here because we really need a total paradigm shift in mobility and batteries are only one part of that. Uh, we discussed that uh, here tonight, but there are a lot more other elements and efficiency for us, for example, is a criteria um, uh, in Luxembourg to receive a subsidy. So it's not just uh, the price um, um, for example, 18 um, kilowatt hours, uh, 80 kilo, uh, will, um, you will achieve uh, 30,000 euros of subsidies, uh, but um, for lower efficiencies, um, you will uh, only get less. So there are economic incentives and to make sure that people don't buy inefficient uh, cars um, because we had a lot of debates on, uh, the in, on the efficiency criteria because there are small cars which use a lot more and that is something that we didn't want in Luxembourg. Um, which brings us back to the point of big or small cars. It's not the only question whether they are big or small but also um, how much energy um, they use or what um, is the capacity of the battery? How much battery power do they need for 100 kilometers? But of course, we will also get rid of the congestion in our cities um, by replacing one car by another car, even if it's an electric car. We really have to uh, reach that shift in mobility. And that's why in Luxembourg, we have been using two thirds of our public money in public transport, in train mobility, so that people have a choice um, that people, for example, in rural areas are connected to the cities and so on. And we want to be emission free by 2030. And um, that is why we make subsidies available as well. Um, when it comes to um, bicycles, for example, we have um, subsidies for regular bikes um, and also for e-bikes for adults and for children, because if we want uh, to motivate people to use this kind of a soft mobility to walk, to cycle and so on, uh, then we need to create that kind of incentive. So, uh, yeah, also use public transport and so on. That's the kind of mobility that we need. And if we want to achieve that, we really need uh, to have a 
um, yeah, very far-reaching um, approach and a very, uh, very clear targets. And that's also what we need on a European level. We need to be brave here uh, when it comes to legislation, for example. And now we're only starting with e-mobility on a European level, and we should um, really promote that in the future. But I think the first point is to create trust. Uh, consumers have to be able to trust in um, a sustainable battery production that um, is really taking sustainability uh, seriously. That's what we have to create with this regulation. So uh, it's not about uh, just replacing one problem with the next, but uh, that will take us beyond uh, this debate. However, there's still a lot to do. Let's see. Well, uh, I do see that uh, you have a lot to say there and a lot of ideas. It was great to listen to all of that. Uh, but now looking at the clock, uh, we don't have a lot of time left. However, there is one question which I know is of a big concern for many people in Germany. And that is why I presented uh, or I, I um, prepared a slide which I actually uh, took from Transport and Environment. <clears throat> Julia, uh, maybe you can also comment on that. Um, so uh, the question is, well, all this battery business, uh, isn't it um, better to use uh, combustion cells? Are batteries even uh, future oriented? Is that the way to go? Um, it's a presentation that I looked at, uh, which was uh, yeah, fascinated, fascinating to me. And I would like to show it on the screen if I can manage. And Maybe Julia can then comment on it as well. But yeah, um, until I manage to, oh, okay, show this uh, slide here. Well, uh, feel free to uh, comment on it, Julia. And uh, please feel free to call me Sven as well. Christina and I um, call each other by our first name, so feel free to do that as well. And here's the slide. Julia, anything to say on that? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thanks a lot for, for sharing this slide. And I think that really shows why when it comes to cars, the most optimal technology, the best we have today is actually to go via direct electrification, which, which means battery electric. I have also seen questions in the chat a lot, which, as you say rightly, Sven, is, is a very German issue about instead of decarbonizing the powertrain, decarbonizing the fuel. And some people are talking about carbon neutral synthetic fuels uh, done with um, renewable electricity. So very honestly with you, in theory, yes, maybe we can do it. But first, these fuels don't exist. Maybe we'll have a little bit of them in 2030. And if we do, we absolutely cannot waste them in cars because we have aviation to decarbonize, shipping, cement, steel, the sectors where today there's no alternative. Whereas in cars, we actually, if anything, have a bit of a freedom to choose the technologies. And because we can use various technologies, we should go for the most efficient one. The entire economy will rely on renewables to go to zero emissions. So it's important that we have the most optimal efficient solutions. Cars go with the most efficient, trucks with the most efficient, and then that's those that left over can have more difficult to produce fuels such as synthetic fuels. Cars can't steal green electrons from other sectors. And if we put uh, synthetic fuels into cars, we simply will have a very inefficient and expensive way to go down the route, just because we don't want to change the engine, even though it's completely feasible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, uh, very, that was very clear. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, all the presentations uh, we will share afterwards uh, on my blog, uh, if authors agree. And um, I will also put there this splendid uh, pre uh, slide. Yeah. Um, Ich habe den Eindruck, die heißesten Fragen aus dem Well, I think the most urgent question from our more than 360 360 questions have been addressed, hopefully. A quick message. 
There's also a colleague, uh, Rex Ruhr, um, from PowerShift, which is contacting me on Twitter. Uh, it's really worthwhile to follow PowerShift. Uh, they have a lot of interesting things to say. So, sorry, um, I would like to come uh, to a conclusion now um, by saying the following. First of all, this is a topic that we will really be very busy with in the European Parliament. The Industry Committee will... Um, soon negotiate its position on the issue but what's even more important is what will be discussed in the envy committee and on in the single market committee for some areas the single market committee with my uh, colleague anna cavazzini will have exclusive competence uh, she is also the chair of uh, that committee and they are the lead committee when it comes to um, responsibility, manufacturers' responsibility, production chain, etc. So all the questions relating to that, standards for the production chain, how do we make sure that the current practice when it comes to um, raw material sourcing and the current practice um, of manufacturing and environmental degradation, violation of human rights, how do we make sure that all this stops um, is um, competence of the uh, single market uh, committee and all the other questions um, are being dealt with in the Envy committee. And by the way, um, batteries, that's not just about e-mobility, but also about the small battery cells um, that we use in our everyday life. So we are really looking at all battery types with this regulation. And uh, for that, I'd be grateful for any kind of information because I wonder, for example, why do we have a lot of um, energy efficiency labels um, for uh, big products um, or big types of users, but not for all these uh, different small batteries that we are using? And how do we know as uh, users, as consumers, um, about the quality that I get when I buy batteries for my everyday use? Um, there's no label for that either. Either So it's not just about e-mobility. There are a lot of topics at stake here. And for us uh, as Greens, um, it's really about uh, a complete transition, a complete shift in mobilities. It's not just by replacing normal cars with e cars. Uh, it's part of the solution, but it's not the solution. Personally, I've never had a car. I'm not intending on to buy a car. I don't even see why I would need a car. Other people do need them, and that's all fine by me. But um, yeah, we really have to change our transport and mobility system. And a, we have to come to a system which needs less cars and that those cars which are still part of that system are as um, ecologically as possible. And that is still part and parcel of our green uh, transport and mobility policy. But another aspect uh, which was mentioned here as well is um, touching on the question that we have regulation of batteries and electronic cars and suddenly we are taking a very close look at all these detailed aspects um, and that shows us how uh, um, for example, one, one example for that are um, YouTube vis videos that take a critical look on um, batteries for electronic vehicles. Why is that? I wonder. Uh, Julia said that's a German issue. <laughs> and that's true because in Germany, there are a large or major economic interests behind that. Uh, economic interest in favor of uh, combustion engines, um, of um, big cars um, that are being manufactured or um, via Germany and there's a big lobby um, for these manufacturers and that is something that we really have to take into account. While I believe that there are a lot of economic opportunities in this paradigm shift in mobility, um, we just need to make sure that we use them. And uh, we can have that circular economy, we can have high social and ecological standards, and we can be a leader for that on a global level. Um, we can be something that other parts of the world would um, aspire to, um, and that would be uh, progress. And we know that technology is certainly better than what uh, we use uh, with combustion engines, and we have to promote these new technologies. 
because we have that responsibility for our people, for human beings, for a nature. And that is why we also want responsible supply chains in Germany and in Europe for all kinds of products, not just for e-mobilities or e-electronic uh, vehicles and their batteries. So we should take a very close look um, at all these areas in all respects. So any information or any remarks uh, you might have, uh, we are looking forward to any of your contributions because we want to learn from the economy, from the corporate world, from scientists, from NGOs, from research. And we will really um, try and take on uh, board everything that you give us as an input and most importantly we really want to stay ambitious we want to move this forward of course we will also have to fight for majorities and uh, we'll certainly do so um, but uh, we'll not let you off uh, the hook easily either um, because we think, and that was mentioned as well, that the targets should be a bit more ambitious. And um, we are trying to get some amendments in, in that respect. Uh, we have time until October to maybe increase the targets and the um, huge interest that um, you have shown in this webinar shows us that it's worth uh, fighting for higher targets. Thank you also for the contribution of the panelists. Uh, good luck with uh, uh, the um, economic uh, side of things, uh, the research side of things, uh, the NGOs, uh, the political side of things, so that finally we will have uh, uh, cities that are uh, congested as they are now. We all want to breathe uh, fresh air in Europe and uh, we have a right to do so. And that's something we shouldn't forget about. Hundreds of thousands of deaths that we have in Europe because of pollution of our air, that's also a major factor caused by combustion. And I think that's really a reason to fight for a different kind of mobility. So all the best to all of you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to the interpreters. Thank you to my team in the background, Jan uh, Yannick, Dr. Max and all the others. And bye bye to the community here, to all listeners. See you soon and have a nice evening. Bye bye.